Hey everyone, welcome to the third lecture in our series on interactive online learning. I'm Sanjay Chaudhary, an assistant professor at Cornell and research scientist at Aurora. Today, we will talk about the most versatile algorithm in the universe, generalized weighted majority. Throughout history, be it learning, optimization, game theory, this algorithm has shown up time and time again. It's stunningly simple to implement, and at the same time, theoretically powerful. So join me as we learn more about this algorithm and how it's impacted various fields in computer science over the decades. Okay, so let's begin by briefly recapping the prediction with expert advice setting that we looked into last lecture. So you have a set of experts and you have an adversary and you're playing a game where at every round you're choosing an expert. Remember, expert is a policy that maps input to output. And when you choose an expert, your adversary chooses a loss function uh, for each of these experts. And uh, we are, moreover, we're in the unrealizable setting, which means every expert makes mistakes. So typically, uh, you know, let's say in round one, you choose expert two, and your adversary hands you a loss vector, uh, where you see that, you know, the expert you chose has a high loss. Maybe you switch to expert one, and the adversary hands you another loss vector that has a high loss for that expert. Um, and so you keep going. Eventually, in some rounds, you get lucky. You choose an expert that actually has low loss. And the objective of the game is to bound regret, which is the difference of two terms. The first term is the loss, total loss of the learner. And the second term is the loss of the best expert in hindsight. So look over all the experts, sum over their losses, and pick the best one. And over time, you want regret to go, grow sublinearly. So the average regret to go to zero. So what is the generalized weighted majority algorithm? It's, as the name suggests, a generalization of the randomized weighted majority algorithm we looked at last lecture. So uh, you begin by initializing weights for each expert to be 1.0. Then for every round uh, t equal to 1 to t, you're going to sample an expert from this probability distribution induced by the weights. Then you're going to receive a loss vector, Lt, from the adversary. Um, so let's say you picked expert 2 and you saw a loss vector 0 0.1, 1 0.0, 0 0.2, 1.0. .0. You're then going to update the weights, Wt, based on exponential of negative epsilon loss. Right, So bump down experts that incur a high loss. And so you keep repeating this step over and over again. Next time, so if you observe another loss vector, and um, this time you bump down experts one and four because they incurred a high loss. Now you can imagine how this algorithm evolves over time. Um, as you play more and more rounds, the weights around the best expert remains large while the other weights keep falling uh, to zero. Okay, so the key idea of GWM is to bump down the weight of experts proportional to the loss that they incur. The question we will be interested in is just how well does GWM work? Before we discuss this question, a quick aside. Um, this algorithm uh, is known by many names. Um, goes by multiplicative weights, um, also goes by hedge. Uh, for more detailed analysis of the algorithm, I uh, highly recommend checking out this paper by Aurora et al. Um, that will be the basis of our lecture today. Okay, so let's compare the three algorithms we've seen thus far. Recall that weighted majority was not randomized. That led to a lot of problems. The other two algorithms are. Uh, what makes GWM unique is that it can deal with continuous loss while the other two algorithms dealt with binary loss. And when we come look at regret guarantee, uh, recall that weighted majority had a mistake bound. Um, that was roughly uh, twice as more mistakes than the best expert. Uh, randomizations slash that factor almost by half. Um, and uh, GWM, in fact, is able to achieve no regret. So we'll look at the proof of GWM and see how it manages to achieve this feat. Let's briefly look at the proof for generalized weighted majority. 
um, the proof strategy we would use is the same strategy that we've been using thus far for weighted majority and randomized weighted majority. That is, track the sum of weights over time. And the intuition is that the sum of weights is in some sense indicative of how many mistakes the learner makes. The more mistakes it makes, the faster the weights shrink. So the weights initially, the sum over weights begin begins at t equal to zero with n and then falls down, decays over time as the learner makes mistakes. And we are going to try to upper and lower bound the sum. The lower bound corresponds to the best expert, the upper bound corresponds to the mistakes the learner makes. Okay, so let's get on with the proof. Let's start with the upper bound. Note that wt plus one is equal to weight at time t times exponential to the power minus epsilon lt. Now by pulling out wt, you get, you can rearrange terms to write it as wt times probability, so expectation of exponent to the power minus epsilon lt. Now what we really wanted is we wanted expectation of the loss, right? To get the expected loss term, uh, that's the first term in the regret. And to do that, to get these two terms to be close together, we'll apply a trick. Um, a property of e to the power x, that it's lower bounded and upper bounded by 1 plus x and uh, 1 plus x plus x squared. Um, and so we can apply this, uh, this property to re rewrite the term as wt times e to the minus epsilon expected loss plus epsilon square. So we have a bound that relates wt plus 1 to wt. And if we apply this bound over, over t time steps, we finally get an upper bound of w1, which is n, if you recall, times e to the uh, sum over expected loss plus epsilon square. Now, the lower bound is much more straightforward. How many mistakes does the best expert make? Uh, simple that. Um, wt plus 1 is e to lower bounded by 1 times e to the power minus epsilon sum over the number of losses made by the best expert. So you can already see that the upper and lower bound both have terms that we want for the regret. And so you simply take the logarithmic to get, over, get rid of the exponent, exponential. Um, and you get I mean, some algebra, rearrange some terms, cancel epsilon on both sides. And you get the expected loss made by the learner is lower bounded by the loss of the best expert plus log n over epsilon plus t times epsilon. Super neat formulation. Okay, so we're almost there. We now need to answer one last question, which is, what is the optimal value of epsilon? What value of epsilon makes the upper bound as tight as possible? Um, the answer is simple. Take the gradient and set it to zero. Epsilon is then square root of log n over t, plug this in to the original upper bound to then get an upper bound on the expected loss of the learner. Um, you can then divide both sides by t to get the average regret, which is uh, square root of log n over t, which we know goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So we have a no regret algorithm. So that concludes the proof. Um, as you can see, GWM is a really pretty algorithm. And if it were only good for solving prediction with expert advice, the story would end here. Interestingly, the reach of GWM is far more universal. Time and time again, in the history of computer science, machine learning, and optimization, it's shown up in different forms. Um, it's shown up as an effective way to solve large-scale linear programming. It's shown up to completely revolutionize machine learning uh, in the form of boosting. It's able to solve min-max games, and it's a powerful optimization algorithm, namely exponential gradient descent. And there's actually a common theme across all of these domains that makes GWM very attractive. Um, so let's try to understand this a little bit abstractly. Let's say we encounter a hard problem. In this problem, we have a set of n arbitrary constraints. Um, think of each constraint as being a function, c, uh, i. So, um, you know, you have constraints c1, c2, c3, up, up to cn. And c, i maps x from 0 to 1, where 0 means the constraint is feasible, 1 means it's feasible. And so it's, it kind of tells you the degree of infeasibility in some sense. 
Uh, and the goal is to find a solution x such that for all i, cix is less than delta. So the constraints are approximately satisfied up to a threshold. Okay, so the, it's presumably it's very hard to find an x that manages to satisfy all the constraints less than delta. So let's suppose we have a solver that can in turn solve easy problems. What is an easy problem? Think of an easy problem as a weighted sum of constraints. So you have a switchboard um, that, switch, that has knobs over each of the constraints. Uh, think of the switchboard representing vector pi. So the weighted sum of constraints represents an easy problem. And if you feed this to a solver, it gives you an x that ensures that uh, the weighted sum of ci is less than delta. And so an easy problem really is solving a mixture of constraints. Okay, so how can we turn a hard problem into a series of easy problems? Now, to answer this question, you have to let go of your preconceived notions and enter the upside down world of duality where good is evil and evil is good. So, the strategy is going to be we are going to choose constraints to feed to the solver to try to break it, to try to make the solver look more and more infeasible. In other words, a learner is going to choose constraints and an adversary is actually going to call the solver. This may sound totally backwards. So in every round, the learner chooses a probability over constraints and the adversary plays a solution. Now, loss over every round is also a little bit backwards. Loss is, says how feasible is a constraint. So it's one minus the constraint. So the more, more feasible the constraint is, the more your loss. In other words, the learner is trying to make loss as high as possible. It's trying to make the adversary as infeasible as possible. And the adversary is trying to play the best solution. Now, if you're me, you're wondering, why does this even work in the first place? I'll tell you how the trick is done. It's going to require a little bit of mental gymnastics. So let's first begin by recalling the guarantee for our generalized weighted majority, right? So the expected loss of the learner is upper bounded by the loss of the best expert plus order of square root log of n over t. Now there's going to be a three-stage trick. Um, the, in the first stage, we're going to say that in every round, no matter what constraint the learner plays, the adversary calls the solver, which we know solves a mixture of constraints. The adversary, in other words, is pretty good. Um, so mathematically, the, the mixture of constraints the learner plays, the adversary is able to solve within a delta threshold. So you can think of this as a lower bound on the expected loss of one minus delta. So the loss of the learner is lower bounded. Stage two, stage two, as a result, we get a lower bound on the best expert. That is the hardest constraint. Um, and this lower bound looks something like you know, 1 minus delta minus O square root of log n over t. The final stage is that a lower bound on the best expert simply means um, the hardest constraint on average over t rounds is satisfied. In other words, if you plug in the expression for loss as a function of constraint, you get that the average uh, of the hardest constraint, so 1 over t, c star xt, that is upper bounded by delta plus uh, square root of log n over t, and as t tends to infinity, that second term goes to zero. So this means that if you simply took an average of, of all the x's that the adversary was playing over t rounds, um, that average will satisfy, will solve your hard problem, which is pretty awesome result. Okay, we are now ready to see GWM in action solving real world problems.
What better way to begin than by looking at large-scale linear programs? This is a framework that was uh, popularized by Plotkin, Shmoy, and Tardos. Um, a, a canonical example is to think of traffic planning for a really large city, right? So you have a graph uh, where nodes are cities and edges are roads, and you're trying to plan traffic for the entire city. Um, you can, think, can kind of represent this problem as finding X, which is some sort of capacity allocation that satisfies a bunch of constraints, maybe average congestion at each node. You can model this as a bunch of linear constraints. Uh, so A, X greater than or equal to B, where rows of A are various constraints. Now this A matrix can be massively large. So this is a hard problem to solve, to find an X that satisfies all these constraints. However, like we said, we have an easy solver available that can solve a single uh, linear constraint, right? And you can think of the single constraint being a mixture of rows over A. Um, all right, so how do we turn this easy solver to actually solve the hard problem? We're going to apply the same strategy we just discussed. That is, we're going to talk about the dual game. So step one, the learner is going to pick a probability over constraints, PT. Um, adversary is going to call us the solver that's going to ensure that PT times A is satisfied. So PT times A transpose X is greater than PT B. And finally, we def will define the loss as um, AXT minus B. So more feasible the constraints, more the loss. Again, things are backwards here. And our strategy is going to be exactly what you, we just discussed. We're going to play GWM that's going to focus on hard constraints. That's going to result in a set of x1, x2, xt that the adversary plays. And if you take the average of these x's that the adversary plays, the claim is that ax is greater than or equal to b minus delta. That is, the hard problem is solved. Let's take a quick look at the proof. It's going to be the same three-stage technique. So we'll begin by writing down the general regret bound for uh, GWM. Then stage one. Um, remember, every round, the adversary is good. It solves the problem. So um, the uh, PTA transpose X is greater than or equal to PTB. Um, in other words, uh, you can re reframe this as being that the uh, loss of the learner is lower bounded. This stage two, this implies that the loss of the best expert is also lower bounded. Um, and in this case, it's simply lower bounded by minus O square root of log n over t. And finally, stage three, that means on average, uh, the hardest constraint is satisfied. So if you plug in the expression for the loss, you get that the average infeasibility of the hardest constraint, so AI star VI star, is lower bounded. Um, this simply means that if you play on average X bar, which is simply the average of all the X's that the adversary returns, X bar um, satisfies the hardest constraint. And so the problem is claimed to be solved. Super simple, right? Okay, let's look at a problem closer to home. Uh, the problem of boosting, uh, specifically add a boost by Freund and Shapire that totally transformed the field of machine learning. So what is boosting? Let's say we are given a hard classification problem that we have to solve that has a super nonlinear boundary. Um, and we don't have a hard classifier um, for whatever reason. Um, the question is, how do we turn a weak classifier that has an accuracy of um, just a little bit over random chance, let's say half plus gamma, um, how do we turn this weak classifier into a strong classifier? The idea of boosting is you take the weak classifier and you apply it on the original data set. Um, of course, it doesn't solve all those problems, so take the problems it didn't solve and apply another weak classifier. And you keep repeating this process. And this Cascaded set of classifiers presumably becomes a strong classifier that's able to carve out a super nonlinear decision boundary. 
And so you get a strong classifier that has an accuracy of 1 minus delta. Okay, so how do we, what's going to be a general strategy to prove that this is true? Once again, just like we did before, we are going to play a dual game. In this dual game, our learner is going to choose a probability PT over data points. The adversary is then going to choose a weak classifier HT um, that um, has an accuracy on this data point, uh, on, on any data set of half plus comma, so a little over random chance. And finally, we're going to define a loss function, LT, that um, is defined over each data point i that says one if the uh, data point is correctly classified and zero otherwise. Okay, so having defined this game, the same strategy is applied. We're going to play GWM. GWM is naturally going to focus on hard data points. That's going to force the adversary to generate a set of hypotheses H1, H2, HT. And then on average over the hypothesis, so if you were to take a majority vote among each of these hypotheses, the claim is that um, this the majority vote would get an accuracy of 1 minus delta. Um, which implies that the majority of these hypotheses is uh, implies a strong learner, a strong classifier. Okay, so the proof for uh, Adaboost will be a little bit more involved than the previous proof, but the strategy remains the same. So we're going to first define u to be the number of unsolved data points by h final, that is the uh, majority vote of h1 to t. Okay, um, we're then going to write down the GWM um, regret bound, but we need to modify it a little bit. So if you recall, the way we derived it is that the weight at time t was lower bounded by the, the best expert's weight and upper bounded by uh, things that look like the uh, expected loss of the learner. Um, and if you take, if you write down this lower and upper bound, take log of both sides, we get that the average expected loss of the learner is less than the average loss of the uh, best expert plus um, some terms that depend on uh, u, right? The number of unsolved data points. Okay, so the first strategy is every round, the weak classifier does a pretty good job. It gets an accuracy uh, of half plus gamma. And that simply means that the expected loss of the learner is uh, lower bounded by half plus gamma. Great. Now in step two, a lower bound on the loss of the learner implies a lower bound on the loss of the best expert. Um, and the best expert here happens to be uh, the unsolved data points u. And so we get a lower bound on uh, the average uh, LT star. And finally, step three, we know that unsolved problems are by definition unsolved. That means that they are wrong by the majority vote. Uh, so that implies an upper bound on the average LT star uh, of half. And so if you pl plug in that expression um, and do a little bit of manipulation, you end up with a upper bound on U, the number of unsolved problems that decays with number of rounds T. Um, so this expression is pretty cool and very intuitive. It essentially says that um, the probability, the fraction of unsolved problems u over n decays with, uh, uh, with time. So as t tends to infinity, delta tends to zero, and you have a strong classifier. It's pretty fascinating that the same proof technique that we developed allows us to prove things about linear programs as well as prove things about boosting and you know um, if you look at the if you look at the Aurora paper you can prove things about solving min max games and so on so um, it's pretty fair to call GWM the most versatile algorithm in the universe and this brings us to an end so the key challenge that we took on in this lecture is to answer the question how do you hedge optimally we presented an algorithm 
generalized weighted majority, or GWM. The idea of GWM is pretty intuitive. Uh, it's to softly update the weights of experts uh, by proportional to x of minus epsilon times the loss incurred. And we also proved that this algorithm is no regret. We then saw that this GWM is indeed a powerful algorithm that in some sense can turn hard optimization problems to easy ones. And the idea is to play GWM on the constraint space. So to bump down easy constraints and bump up hard constraints. And this general idea is applicable to boosting, linear programming, games, and much more. Now, as we end the lecture, uh, one question remains, which is a sus lingering suspicion. That is, what is so special about the form of the expression x of minus loss. Why does it show up over and over again in imitation learning, in decision making, and so on? The answer is there is indeed a deep connection between this expression and the principle of maximum entropy. That is a fundamental way for learning distributions. And hopefully this will be a topic that we'll explore in an upcoming lecture. Till then, take care.